Hi folks, welcome. We will get started shortly. We'll give a minute or so uh, for folks to join us. Uh, hello to old friends and new. We're excited to share with you all what we've been up to this past year. Um, so again, we'll get started in a minute or two. Well, we want to honor everybody's time and make sure we get through uh, all that we have to share with you today. So let's get started. So again, welcome uh, so much to our Carnegie Elective Classifications year, uh, 2022 year in review. We're really excited to share with you uh, what we've been up to this past year and what we hope to move forward uh, in, in this new year. So next slide. So I'm Mudley Sol Morales, and I serve as the executive director of the Carnegie Elective uh, Classifications. I started in this role uh, actually a year ago uh, today, and uh, I'm uh, so happy to, to be with you. Um, we have our team up here that works on the different electives. Um, Lauren Bartschi, who's our associate director, John Saltmarsh, who serves as our visiting fellow with the Carnegie Foundation, and Carla Ortega Santori, who is with Rice University and uh, helps direct the Leadership for Public Purpose uh, elective classification. Um, and so we'll jump right into it um, with also a reflection from the Carnegie Foundation. So, Manuelito. Thanks, Marisol. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just a few words here before we get started. Uh, my name is Manuelito. I am the uh, Managing Director of the Center for Post-Secondary Innovation at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Um, I help provide support on this project uh, to our Senior Vice President, Paul LeMahieu, who's somewhere on a plane trying to get here to the Rainy Bay Area. So fingers crossed that he is safe and sound. Um, so on behalf of the Foundation, I'm really here just to say how really super, super excited we are uh, about this project and our partnership with ACE. We're extremely grateful to the hard work of Marisol, Lauren, Ted, Mushtaq, Sarah, a bunch of other folks um, for their leadership and tenacity, um, for their colleagueship, um, and really there's sort of ongoing work and attention to, to, keep, to keep us moving forward. Um, we've done a lot of work. Um, it's amazing uh, from various presentations in different countries and different campuses to convenings, to visioning meetings, to trainings, to institutional roundtables. So we're super, super excited. And I learn a lot every time I get to hang out with these cool kids. So we look forward to deepening our work and our partnerships in the years ahead. So thanks so much for being here. Over back to you, Marisol. Thanks, Manuelito. Um, so let's move forward. So we wanted to begin by uh, providing an overview of the elective classifications for folks who might be newer to um, what these electives do. So next slide. Um, so thanks to the foundation, we also have some really nice new logos, uh, bright and colorful, I think just like us. Um, and so what we have developed um, with the suite of elective classifications are different color coded um, logos or badges for each of the electives. So as you see, we have um, the community engagement um, classification, uh, which has been the traditional one. We have the classification for leadership for public purpose, which is now in blue. And we also have uh, our community engagement classification for Australia and Canada. Australia uh, launched in 2022, and we're hoping that Canada will be launching in 2023. And so these will continue to be for those campuses who successfully achieved um, the classification this coming cycle. Uh, this will be your, your new batch, and we're really excited about uh, this. Next slide. So as many of you know, um, as of April 1st, the Carnegie uh, elective classifications moved over to ACE. Um, so last year during this time, we were in transition from um, Albion College um, and then through 
shift over to um, ACE. And so um, the exciting piece about this is um, with this move to ACE it will be the first time that both the universal as well as elective classifications are brought together under the same uh, organizational home. So this allows for ongoing connection and collaboration um, and the, both the foundation as well as um, ACE are working together uh, in a collaborative way to develop new and refined versions of the classifications that better reflect the, pu the public purpose mission, uh, focus, and impact that these classifications have on higher education. So this move has really allowed us to do the things that we have dreamed of. Uh, if, for those of you who have been connected with the classifications, uh, for a long time, you know that for many years we held it together with uh, duct tape and bubble gum, and so um, the ability to um, raise funds, create um, different organizational and um, structures to support applicant campuses has really been the focus of what we've tried to do this past year, and we'll share that with, with you. Um, and all of this through the collaboration between the foundation and ACE. So what do the elective classifications do? You know, they were developed, uh, we're in our 17th year of the elective classifications. It was really meant to complement the universal classifications. Um, it's the evidence in this self-study is provided through an application process that the institution elects to participate in. The this self-study process takes about a year to year and a half, um, and it really, uh, means to bring disparate parts of the institution together to really reflect on a specific public purpose theme, in this case, community engagement or leadership for public purpose. Um, it's not a tool that creates hierarchy or levels of classification, um, and it's really meant to encourage innovation and improvement in the core academic functions of higher education. Um, it has been designed to respect the diversity of its institutions and their varying approaches to public purpose mission. Um, it's one of the few spaces within um, the classification system that all types of institutions can play in the same sandbox, right? From community colleges um, to four-year privates, four-year publics, um, and, the, and graduate schools, medical colleges, all those different types of higher ed institutions. Um, it's a process that engages the institution in uh, inquiry, reflection, and self-assessment. And it really seeks to honor institutional achievements while promoting ongoing improvement. Um, and then campuses can claim the electives as part of their institutional identity and also seek for uh, movements towards continuous improvement in the work that uh, they're doing. And so we have a number of campuses that are up for third time reclass. So this will be the third time that they're um, you know, engaging in this process that for us demonstrates real commitment to community engagement. Next slide. Um, so what are the guiding principles uh, and criteria for the electives? One, um, and this is as we're thinking about not only community engagement and leadership for public purpose, but also putting forward additional electives that campuses can apply for. So it really meant to reflect manifestations of deep commitment to public purpose at an institutional level and elevate particular modes uh, into the teaching, learning, and scholarly missions of our institutions. It seeks to be a field force in the direction of continuous improvement and people-centered systems change. Um, it is rooted in a clear definition. I think one of the hallmarks of the community engagement elective has been the community engagement um, uh, uh, definition that we have that really guides the way we evaluate, as well as the questions that are contained in the application process. And there has to be an existing higher education field where the classification theme can be seeded and nurtured. And so, you know, in the case of community engagement really came about during a time when the field was um, developing that there was a movement towards this, and we seek for that to be the case with any new and additional electives that we bring forward. Next slide. Um, so before we get into kind of everything that we have done, we wanted to kind of provide you with what gave us the impetus and what guided our work um, this past year, and really was looking at the data. So we had the opportunity to look at the data from the 2020 application cycle. And while um, there were 194 campuses that applied, 119 campuses received the classification. So that was a achievement rate of 61%, which means um, it's difficult but doable. 
So we were satisfied with those numbers. But then as we began to break down the um, classification uh, for different kinds of campuses, um, there were things that we noticed. We only had four HBCUs that applied and only one was classified, an attainment rate of 25%. Hispanics serving institutions, we had more, 29 that applied, but 14 that were classified, 48% attainment rate. And community colleges, 14 that applied and three that were classified, again, a 21% uh, classification rate. So for us, this really indicated both the areas that we needed to improve and do outreach, but thinking about the ways that we could change our policies and practices to be more reflective of these kinds of institutions. And so much of the work that we developed this past year has really been geared about um, increasing participation rates from these specific types of institutions and making sure um, that those types of institutions were reflected in various aspects of our organizational structure for the uh, community engagement elective. And so this is really this data is what really grounded um, the work that we did moving forward. So out of those, we developed our values and goals for 2022. We wanted the elective classifications to be of and by the field, uh, meaning that the field uh, had supported the community engagement elective classification for many years, um, and we wanted it to be reflective, uh, more reflective of, of the field, both in the spaces of participation uh, in the application process, but also in representation on our National Advisory Committee. Uh, we wanted it to be uh, driven, uh, people driven. Uh, or people centered. So thinking about the practitioners and the folks who put the, the application together and work diligently to do that, and what could we do to support them. And we wanted it to be driven by both equity and collective action. And so being really conscious and uh, interrogating the numbers and the representation and making sure that we were doing all of the outreach um, that we could um, to encourage uh, diverse representation. We want it to be something that pushes without pulling. So thinking about balanced rigor, thinking about the application itself, how many questions um, did we did we ask? What was the organization of, of the application? Um, and how did that uh, become a balanced rigor process that allowed uh, increased participation? Yeah, we wanted to increase participation, transparency, and field learning, and there are several projects that we'll talk about that contributed um, to this. And part of our transparency was, was about sharing the, that data um, with folks as we did our different presentations and listening to folks so that we could learn about how to both increase participation as well as um, what the process looked like for folks on campus. And then continue to understand and use data, thinking about who's participating and where and how we can do our work um, better. So a lot of listening um, as well. Next slide. Some of our milestones in the way we try to organize our work. Um, one is that we looked at our National Advisory Committee. So we uh, sought to improve relationships with our National Advisory Committee and we recruited new members from targeted institution types. We updated and launched the classification framework. So we drafted improvements to the framework for clarity and succinctness. Um, we did outreach and engagement. So we developed a targeted outreach and stakeholder support initiatives. Uh, we'll talk more about those later. Uh, we tried to do cross elective alignment. So thinking about the critical collaboration between US based um, electives as well as our international partners and making sure that the folks who were connected to the um, elective classifications were in communication and supported um, one another. And finally, uh, what we're really excited about is the new electives development. So there was a retreat that we hosted um, to envision a creation of future electives. Um, and we're actually in the process of feasibility studies right now. Next slide. Um, and I know that we're getting a bunch of questions, and so we will work towards um, answering those as we move along. Um, the elective classification for community engagement. So let's do a deep dive in that. So we currently have 356 campuses that are classified, which means they were classified in the 2015 or the 2020 cycle. Um, what's fantastic about this, we have a little map here that shows the institutional spread. 
Um, it's represented in 49 states and territories. So currently every state in the, in the continent of the United States, except for Wyoming, North Dakota, and South Dakota, uh, pretty even split between private and public institutions. And um, we're consistently trying to reach out to new institution spaces by type, size, geography, et cetera. Um, the classification years are named for when the application cycle is announced. And then students also have to reclassify. So the map doesn't represent here visually who is a first time or reclassification institution. Um, that's a pretty good split as well. So we um, went through a framework um, structure revision process with the community engagement classification last fall in anticipation of releasing about this time last year. Um, our goal is kind of a more thematic reorganization that chunked questions together and focused on smaller thematic sections instead of really large sections of subfields. Our goal was to improve clarity about what kind of information was being asked and what should be included in responses. We also had the goal to reduce the number of questions that were asked and to reduce the amount of information that was being asked within each question. So, for example, in previous cycles, we had kind of large tabular questions that asked multiple examples per theme. And instead, we tried to replace a number of those tabular questions with describe two, but not more than four examples of the following practices as they relate to community engagement to kind of help institutions focus their efforts on what they're really describing and give them space to tell some really great stories of their work. And what this looks like, um, so the 2020 application had 70 questions for the first time cycle. Um, and now in the 2024 cycle um, application, we had 62 questions. For reclassification, there were 76 questions. Reclassification institutions, again, um, are reapplying to maintain their status and usually ask a bit more and more in-depth questions. And then in 2024, there's 68 questions. So we're able to kind of, again, balance that rigor um, and make sure institutions are really um, looking at questions that um, really show in the depth and breadth of their work. Um, for the first time, we also integrated IPEDS data into the application. Um, so institutions, when they apply, enter in their IPEDS unit ID, which then pulls in automatically enrollment, faculty, um, student data, et cetera, into the applications. They have to go digging that down and allows our reviewers to see those things right up front. We also then use the IPEDS data to establish a sliding scale equitable fee structure that looks like um, looks at um, student enrollment versus student expenditure per student to kind of help us visualize what that might look like and uh, um, establish a fee accordingly. Um, we also were able to implement a community partner survey in Spanish for the first time. Um, in the 2020 cycle, we um, piloted a, pil a community partner survey to help us um, hear from partner organizations of our institutions and truly really understand what they're doing on the ground and how those partnerships look like um, in reflection. And we're able to establish that in Spanish to um, help institutions select a more diverse profile of community partners to, to, partner, um, to hear from. Um, and we were able to update and kind of improve our guides for the community engagement classification frameworks. So in addition to the questions being released publicly early um, ahead of the application being purchased, we established guides that uh, detail a little more in depth as to what the application is asking um, to support our institutions in, in working on those applications together. So we are in the middle of our 2024 cycle timeline. Um, so again, those cycle years are named for when the application um, results are announced. So we are approaching in a few months that May 1st, 2023 application deadline. We will be busily working on the review process starting in the summer. And then we'll announce internally to applicant campuses in December, 2023 of their status. And then in January, 2024, we'll make the national public announcement of recipient campuses. This will follow immediately by the 2026 application cycle. We in, um, intend to open and release the application January 26th of next year. Um, we hold a peer review process, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so we have an internal purchase deadline by November 4th of 2024 that helps understand how many reviewers you will need for the application process. 
We'll have a submission of April 1st, 2025. And again, have the internal notifications happen in December, 2025, and the national public announcement in January of 2026. So let me just share a little bit about the peer review process. Um, historically, it has been a smaller uh, review team that has uh, reviewed all of the application. Um, and I think aligning with our goal of making this of and by the field, we wanted to open up the review process, both as an opportunity for uh, campuses to, to learn, um, to increase transparency, but also have greater participation from the field. And so, um, with this, we, we are piloting our peer review process. Um, we did this by um, identifying an acquired by date, which uh, campuses would notify us if they were gonna be pursuing the um, classification this cycle. That let us know how many applications, more or less, we would have to review. Uh, we launched a call for reviewers uh, between November and December, um, and we were really excited to see the interest in folks uh, serving as reviewers. So we um, had 105 applicants to serve as uh, peer reviewers or reviewers for the application um, review process, um, and we are we will be selecting um, 35. And so we're in the process of reviewing those and we'll be sending out within the next week or so um, letters to those who have um, been selected as well as those who, who, are, who were not selected to, to serve as reviewers. But this just demonstrated for us the real interest um, in this uh, and the opportunity that we have to bring in more people into this process. Um, we will be training reviewers um, between January and March, um, and we will be uh, assigning review teams. Um, the review teams will be um, made up of three folks uh, representing different kinds of institutions. They'll be supported by um, graduate fellows. We'll also be doing a call for graduate fellows to help um, support the um, review process and the review teams. Uh, and then the reviews, uh, it's a tiered base review process. So tier one is the peer review process. Tier two is a senior review committee made up of folks who have reviewed in the past and who will serve um, to uh, look at applications where the review teams were not able to review, uh, achieve consensus. And the final review will be uh, through the uh, elective classifications uh, team that will review um, each application. Our hope as well is to be able to provide specific feedback to each institution, both those who achieved the classification and those who did not on their specific application. And so we're moving towards being able to do that um, by adjusting uh, and creating protocols within our review process that allows for that individualized feedback to, to campuses. So we're really excited about this pilot, um, especially in anticipation of an increased number of applications for the 2026 cycle. So you're very busy with capacity building program in 2022. Um, we were, I uh, felt like every single week this past fall, we were on the road, and many, I think we were. Um, so we engaged in 19 conference presentations, workshops, and meetings this past year um, to meet the diverse array of um, constituents across the country from large scale national conferences to state run workshops and anything between. Um, we held seven webinars and different topics for, um, about the application from starting the application process, figuring out if you're ready, building out a team, um, and think tenure promotion pro policies um, in a variety of capacities to think, help institutions really pick apart what they're looking at um, and make their next steps. For the first time this fall, we started open Q&A sessions where institutions can drop in, ask anything they'd like about where they're at in the application, um, and then kind of brainstorm together or with us possible solutions or just thinking through the next um, kind of a variety of ways to proceed. Um, they've been really beneficial um, for helping us understand maybe sticking points in the application process, um, items of clarity. We actually kind of improved our guide based off of one of the Q&A sessions um, to help offer additional clarity clarity for, for all folks, um, and again, another space for people to collaborate together. Um, through this programming, we reached over 1,700 individuals um, at over 380 institutions and organizations. 
um, we were really excited to be able to um, use ACE's platform called AC Engage, which is a hybrid learning management system, social media platform, um, where it's a collaboration space and kind of a document repository space for folks to engage together. We currently have um, 250 plus members who can kind of ask questions of each other, collaborate, make small groups. We can host events on there and kind of keep a collective documentation. Um, the goal for this AC Engage platform is to not only have folks support the application process, um, but to also think beyond the application of best practices and really collectivize in the community together throughout the way. Um, and within our 2024 application process, beyond the capacity building numbers, this has resulted in currently sitting at 92 applications for the 2024 application cycle. Um, if um, campuses were, um, were last classified in 2015, they were able to select reclassifying in this current 2024 cycle or waiting to the next 2026 cycle. So of that 92, about two thirds are first time applicants and one third are reclassifying because a majority of the reclassifying institutions decided to wait until 2026. So we anticipate a much, much larger number applying in the next cycle. And, you know, I have to say um, we were, we try to be out there as much as possible this past year, present, talking about the changes, engaging with folks. Um, and I think that shows in our stakeholder participation numbers and in our institutional reach and the number of folks that we have who are participating in AC Engage. So if you haven't connected to AC Engage, we'll have a um, uh, opportunity for you to um, get connected to that, but please, you know, think about the ways that we can continue to engage folks. We're definitely about um, engagement and partnership, and so um, these service avenues to, to do that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carla Ortega Santori. Um, I feel a lot better than I sound, I promise. Kind of a sore throat. Um, but um, I'm going to talk to you all about the Leadership for Public Purpose classification. And this is a newly launched elective classification. Um, I come from the Door Institute at Rice University, and we are the stewards of this classification um, for this cycle, maybe the next upcoming cycle. Um, and we work really closely with Lauren Marisol and the whole ACE team and Carnegie team um, to model the leadership classification um, closely um, after the CE classification. Um, and I'd like to explain how we got here, how this new classification came to be. Um, so about two years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, um, we were at the Door Institute thinking about how we could work towards the improvement of leadership education and development across higher ed. Because the landscape of leadership um, education and development was kind of all over the place. There's a lot of people doing a lot of great things, um, but there's a lot of variability in programs. Um, and also, did you know that leader or leadership is mentioned in over 800 um, university and college missions? Um, it's, it's highly referenced. Um, a lot of universities and colleges say it's part of their core function or their mission, um, but there's little evidence of that. Um, we don't see, um, as much painstaking um, effort made to record, track, and monitor this. So um, we were thinking about a way to improve leadership education and development, but also ways to recognize excellence in it. Um, and that's where the elective classification and their system came in. And we started collaborating on how we could um, develop this classification, this framework, um, and launch it eventually. So it all started back in January 2020, um, and we hosted our first um, consortium meeting, and we basically gathered around 30 scholars and practitioners from 27 different institutions, really focused on um, representing all institution types. So we had people from small liberal arts colleges, um, a community college, big state schools, um, and we focused on gathering all their perspectives um, to make this as um, holistic as possible. And we wanted to come together to come up with this framework and also discuss how we would define leadership and what would be the indicators of a committed institution. 
we didn't really come to an agreement on leadership per se, but we did discuss what leadership for public purpose could be and how that could be represented in institutions, um, how that would show up for institutions that are committed to this, that are um, <clears throat> advancing efforts like this on campus. And um, after that, we drafted and revised a framework. So once we had a definition and a draft, um, we sent it out to 100 plus scholars and practitioners to get their feedback. And mind you, this framework is closely modeled after the CE framework. So a lot of sections might seem similar. Um, the first one or two sections are, um, are pretty similar. And the team at ACE did a really neat job at um, comparing the two frameworks. Um, and that document is actually available on their website. So feel free to browse. I know that a lot of you are very um, familiar with CE and you might not be as familiar with leadership. So you can take a look at that and see where it coincides, where it differs. Um, but anyways, I digress. Uh, we sent it out this draft. We um, gathered feedback from these scholars, practitioners. Um, we revised that feedback. And then we knew that before we launched this classification, before institutions could apply, um, we had to kind of test, it, test this out and do a pilot um, like CE did back in the day. So um, we invited every institution we knew to um, go through this self-study and um, nine institutions went through it. So they created their campus teams, they collected data um, and completed their applications. Once they submitted, a core team of reviewers evaluated those applications and offered feedback to the pilot cohort. So um, it was a very individualized and then um, a cohort-based feedback so that they could improve their applications. And we, this process, um, revealed so much, so many opportunities to improve and common tendencies among applicants. And I think this is something that Marisol and Lauren um, mentioned, but uh, institutions are, in a lot of things, are more um, similar than what we may think. A lot of sections um, have not the same results, but we struggle with the same things or we notice the same things. Um, and those tendencies were very clear, um, but each institution had such different contexts and circumstances that were very interesting to, to learn more about. And we could adjust our um, process and our framework um, to reflect that. And we finally launched in March, 2022. I feel like I've taken you on a wild ride in these few minutes, but, um, we launched in March, 2022. Um, we're so excited to have the applications out and open right now. Um, it is our very first cycle, the inaugural cycle. And we are currently hosting webinars and workshops to provide support and information. Um, actually, can you um, go to the next slide, please? So this is where we are. Um, and you'll see the timeline is very similar to CE and the milestones are big things that have to happen, but CE did have um, uh, did have some some um, more time to launch their application and whatnot. So we are a little behind, um, but we're looking to to catch up and and be on the same or similar um, timeline. But anyways, applications are now open. <clears throat> They will be open until December 1st, 2023, but like CE, we are um, enforcing this um, intend to apply deadline in July 1st, 2023, and you can start your application by then and work on it until December 1st, 2023, um, and campuses won't be notified um, on May 2024, and um, the public announcements will be made in June. Um, so we'll be getting to a similar timeline, but we are hosting a lot of webinars and workshops to supplement um, and aid in this application process that is completely new. Um, and so we're learning a lot as we go through this um, and ways that we've kind of already engaged our um, stakeholders and the community is We've hosted some uh, presentations already. We've been to ALE, ILA, 
We went to Kumu with our friends from ACE, um, and we've had a few individual meetings, which have been, um, I think, more revelatory than than any conference, right? When you get to sit one-on-one -on -one with someone and, and talk about their university institution. Um, we've hosted webinars, and um, they're all recorded and available for you either on our higher led platform, which is very similar to the ACE Engage platform. It's the same mighty networks um, kind of feel to it, but it's different. It's obviously focused on leadership. Um, it's free to join, so you can join now um, and join us on this platform, Higher Led. And it's really just a great place to connect with others that are like-minded um, scholars and practitioners alike to, like Lauren said, share best practices, get together. It's very, um, very self-initiated. So as a member, you can do so much. You can post questions, polls, you can start events, post Zooms. Um, so you don't depend on the administrators, really. Um, there's learning communities on there. There's special events. Um, and um, I encourage all of you to join ACE Engage and Higher Lead. Um, and we've also had um, an overwhelming, I think, a participation from stakeholders. I think this past year since we've gone back to in-person, it's been so great to um, connect with people in real life and learn and um, kind of get a feel for the momentum of people going through this application process at their institutions. Um, I think we've engaged with over 175 institutions, either through our distribution list or our webinars or our different presentations. Um, so it's great to learn about this developmental process that you all are going through and um, doing it together. So across elective alignment, some of the things now that we have more than one elective is um, thinking about the ways in which we connect and coordinate um, our work together. So thinking about representation of um, ACE Carnegie administrative team. So Lauren and myself as ex officio members of Leadership for Public Purpose, the Australian um, and the Australian um, uh, Community Engagement Elective, as well as the Canadian National Advisory uh, Committees and Working Groups. So really trying to provide that stewardship and support and make sure that there's communication amongst and across the different electives. Um, we have regular meetings to coordinate and align efforts. We are co-presenting at conferences about the various electives and trying to uh, bring about awareness uh, about the multiple electives. And then we also had uh, participation from uh, Leadership for Public Purpose uh, at our new electives development retreat. And so maintaining this suite of electives also means thinking about how there's coordination across um, these electives and ways that we can continue to support um, the new electives development and uh, be in alignment with the desires, wishes uh, of the foundation um, and really support our role as stewards of the elective classifications. Internationalization. So we're really excited about this piece. Um, this has been about four years uh, in the making for both Australia and Canada. Uh, and it was, you know, sort of, there was some bumps in the road due to COVID, uh, but we were excited that in 2022, Australia, um, the Australian pilot uh, host organization launched its uh, application is now in the process of collecting applications from uh, institutions of higher education in Australia and New Zealand for the community engagement elective classifications. We've also been working closely with Canada and they um, in 2023 will officially launch their um, application process. Um, and we've had uh, conversations with other countries that are interested in the community engagement elective. Um, we've had conversations with folks from Thailand, Vietnam and South Africa and are exploring ways to develop the application or at least a pilot of the community engagement uh, elective application in those countries. I think one of the interesting things or positions of the foundation is that, um, you know, they're not interested in just exporting an American version, but really how do we 
uh, work deeply with uh, representatives from other countries who know their higher ed systems and adapt the elective classifications to be reflective of um, the needs, cultures, and climate of higher education in their respective countries. And so that it also fosters and will foster this deep learning across um, different uh, higher ed uh, systems in different countries and thinking about this as really a global movement um, that connects uh, learning and continuous improvement in partnership with our various communities. So next slide. Right, outreach and engagement. So in addition to our various capacity building exercises, uh, we again try to improve our methods of outreach and engagement to stakeholders and institutions. This included developing a new website of last year, of January 2022, that kind of unified and streamlined information about collective classifications into one place. Here's where you can find information about upcoming workshops and trainings and webinars, um, PDFs of the application frameworks and guides, um, publications about the elective classification and similar topics in a whole assortment of different kinds of um, systems to help support you in the application process. As Carl and I mentioned, we also launched AC Engage and Higher Lead this past year. Um, they're kind of on, like, online forms for peer-to-peer -peer support and collaboration that have opened a whole new host of capacity building mechanisms that I'm really excited. Um, we part, uh, for the community engagement elective classification, we partner with Campus Compact to launch three communities of practice, focusing on community colleges, third time applicants, so those who have a, will, have, will be reclassifying for a second time, and also in tenure promotion policies as relate to community engagement and community engaged practices. We also work together to kind of streamline some external communication processes, such as newsletters, press releases, and other public outreach with ACE's marketing and communications team. We are very thankful for them um, to kind of improve um, the kind of spread or the word about what elective classifications do and their purpose. We also um, put together a consultant group for the first time. Oh, John, go ahead, you're here. Oh, that's okay, you're doing great. <laughs> go for it, John. Yeah, so uh, just to follow up on what Marisol had said earlier around the consultants, um, or around the, yeah, around the consultants. So we have a, a group of consultants this year. Um, and the idea here was that uh, campuses are often looking for help in terms of putting together an application, thinking through institutionalization. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide them with a group of scholars who have um, been through a training with us and would provide kind of consistent um, and correct information to them. Um, so we did a training with a group of uh, 23 individuals and uh, they are available for a consultation. A number of them have already begun working with campuses, sometimes with multiple campuses. Um, and they are on our website, so I won't go through who all of them are. But if you're looking for that kind of assistance, um, they're out there. Um, and again, I think this provides a good model for how we think about electives going forward, um, that we provide these kinds of resources for campuses so that they can build their own capacity around community engagement. You can go to the next slide. Um, we also um, have abundance of data around the community engaged elective classification and will in the future have data for leadership public purpose and other elective classifications that we want to be available for um, education researchers and graduate students who are thinking about their dissertations and higher education topics. So there are currently two projects that started in the last year and are in progress. We want, um, one of those was analysis um, promotion and tenure policies within the 2022 community engagement classification data. That was done by a team from the University of Michigan and UCLA. Um, this past September, they hosted a webinar to kind of share what they learned and how it can be applied to the community engagement classification process. Um, it was a fantastic webinar, really interesting research and highly informative to not just the application itself, but how we really consider faculty reward processes. So I encourage you all to check out our website and that webinar recording because it was really fascinating. 
Um, we are also in the process um, of doing an oral history of the development of the community engagement classification by doing interviews from kind of the core members who founded the application process. We'll be sharing that in the months ahead. If you are a higher education researcher and are interested in the work um, of the community engagement elective classification data and what how that might contribute to your research project, um, there is a form on our website that is a data usage request and research agreement. Um, it asks about your scope, methodology, data management plan, and the kind of data you would like to be using. We have code books for all the past classification cycles, um, the applications and their questions, so you can kind of see what data be available and what you might need. After that, we also we have a um, conversation with you about that methodology and data management plan and process, and if what you've requested will accurately pertain to the research question and what we can actually provide in alignment with our privacy policies. Um, after approval of IRB and that kind of agreement of the data um, use and request, then we can prepare a data set and deliver it um, for a certain amount of time for you to complete your research. And then just like above, we ask that you research, you share that research finding publicly in collaboration with our team at a later date. And we really want to encourage the access and use of this data for continued learning about the elective classifications and the way that this process helps um, to improve um, the field. All right. So we could not do this work without uh, the brilliance and expertise of folks who serve on our uh, national advisory committees. And so I just want to take this as an opportunity to express our immense gratitude for the leadership that these folks have taken, particularly this past year, in supporting the community engagement elective. Um, providing amazing feedback, uh, helping us uh, develop processes that are more inclusive, um, and really being champions of this uh, elected classification for many, many years. Um, so I just wanna highlight their leadership uh, and their particular, our particular love for all of them, um, especially this past year. Can we go to the next slide? Carla? And um, I guess I will thank my national advisory committee in advance for all the expertise and knowledge that they will provide um leading up to this launch we haven't been we wouldn't be able to do everything that we've done without a lot of the people that are here on this um on this slide um and people that aren't listed here um but um yeah i'm excited for all the work that we will be doing and all the influence they will have on on this new cycle And then we also have advisory committees uh, in Australia. And so these folks have really sh helped shepherd um, the pilot and the launch. Uh, we continue to be involved um, with them and we'll continue to be in coordination with them as well as with uh, Canada and their uh, working group that is has been working diligently uh, from these different uh, pilot uh, participating pilot institutions to get the pilot launch, to learn from that, and to create and launch a process um, that all institutions of higher ed in Canada will be able to participate in. And this is part of how we make the, the electives of and by the field, is through our national advisory committees. All right, let's talk about new electives development. Um, so this is our uh, roadmap uh, for um, the new electives development. Back in October, we had a retreat between staff from the Carnegie Foundation and ACE staff, as well as um, some of the folks from the foundation who initiated the community engagement elective to really learn about what the process looked like, think about what were going to be the guiding principles and criteria for future electives development um, and begin to put that process together. And so we are currently in a feasibility study uh, process that's taking place that started in December and will conclude in March, where we're looking at um, four potential elective themes. And I want to say there were about 24 themes that actually emerged during the course of the retreat in October before that kind of kept uh, surfacing and that collectively we decided that we wanted to pursue. So the four are sustainability, indigenous serving, student veterans, and justice impacted students. Um, justice impacted students, for those who don't know, are those students who are either currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, or family uh, members that have been impacted by 
uh, incarceration or the criminal justice system and the ways in which our higher ed institutions are creating programs that support these types of, of students. Um, and so our hope is through this feasibility study to identify frameworks and really answer a series of questions about, you know, how can any of these or all of these uh, be explored as additional electives? Uh, will they be in the same, um, have the same stature or application process? And then how do we look at this uh, at the application process for institutions who are interested in applying for multiple um, uh, electives? Um, so we're excited about the deep learning that we're um, doing this. Our hope is to uh, conclude the feasibility study in early March, um, get some field feedback um, that we can, additional field feedback that we can share with the Car with Carnegie and ACE leadership um, and um, have them make some decisions about which um, electives we begin to announce. Um, we will be announcing, our, our goal is to announce the next elective during ACE's annual meeting in April of this year, um, and then also provide a timeline and some baseline criteria. We will be, depending on which elective we move forward, we'll be uh, gathering a group of individuals to help us develop um, definitions, what a potential application could look like, and identify additional field experts that can help us um, move towards a pilot launch of um, the, the new elective. So we're really excited about this and the idea of creating a suite of electives. Next slide. So goals for the future of the elective classifications. Well, one is launch the new elective. Um, two is really thinking about a common app style application that can be used across the different um, public purpose theme areas. And so what would a common app look like? What kind of questions would we ask? Because um, we also want to make the uh, application doable for all types of institutions, understanding you know, that it oftentimes can be uh, a lengthy and onerous uh, process. Um, in 2025, we will be celebrating 20 years of community engagement elective. And so, you know, uh, reflecting back on what we have learned from the, the 20 years of community engagement elective and sharing back knowledge and honoring folks who've participated in this uh, process over the last 20 years. So we're excited about that. And it gives us an opportunity to also um, celebrate with one another and um, if you know me, I, I like parties, and so we will also make it a celebratory. Um, we want to increase research using the electives um, classifications data and make that available. We want to build community across the electives, so thinking about the different learning that we can do, not only the folks who are administering this, but also the fields themselves. And we're seeking to develop new uh, partnerships to increase institutional diversity. So um, if you come from different organizations, know that our open sign is, is turned on and we're looking to create partnerships to help boost the electives and the field learning that can take place from, from this process. We're busy in 2022 and we'll continue to be busy in 2023. Um, so a number of upcoming events and capacity building activities to support both elective classifications for community engagement and, leader and leadership. That includes next week, you will see us at AAC New, um, where we will be doing a joint presentation on the community engagement and leadership classifications, and then a separate one just for leadership later on that afternoon. Um, on Wednesday, February 1st, we'll be hosting a, um, a webinar about partnerships um, with Dr. Byron White from UNC Charlotte, which we're very excited about. On March 1st, we'll be hosting a webinar for the Community Engagement election, um, elect, Elective about assessing data and, and examples for the application process. Um, March 4th, in Mar mid March, is the Western Region Community Service um, uh, work, uh, conference where Marisol will be giving a keynote address. So we look forward to that. Um, in March, um, Carla will be heading out to the ACPA convention to talk about leadership public purpose. We'll be hosting a, web, a workshop just for HBCUs in late March at Stillman College in Alabama. Um, Carla will also be at the NASPA conference on April 1st for leadership public purpose. And then we'll be doing the ACE annual meeting. You will find us there, of course, as well, talking about elective classifications. And there'll be many more things in the plans over the coming months. So watch out, watch your inboxes um, to see us on the road or on Zoom. 
We're also excited to announce some collaboration with Collaboratory. We'll be hosting some monthly networking calls on AC Engage for the Community Engagement Elective. These are much more opportunities to talk about institutions about best practices beyond the application and ways to think about implementing data, strategy, and other ways of kind of collaboration. Um, they're going to start this spring, and we anticipate continuing them throughout the summer and fall 2023. Um, the first one's on January 23rd. And so you can find the links for those on AC Engage. And we're very thankful for our friends at Collaboratory for initiating this idea um, and seeing it through with us through our, through our platform. And we keep talking about AC Engage and higher lead. Um, so these are QR codes to join. Um, you can also find them directly on the front page of our website. Um, but I'll hold these up for a little while so you've got a chance to um, uh, flash your phone and join. Um, we just asked for AC Engage to help you in the process. Um, it asks you how you learn about AC Engage. You type in Carnegie. That'll help us sort through that you're in the right place and get into the right program on AC's platform. And I'll also, talk, I'll also toss the invite links into the chat here in just a minute. And this is our website. Before we jump into Q&A, this is the best way to find information about the elective classifications and to find out more from us. Yeah, and before we sort of move into um, the uh, Q&A session, I do want to announce some of the things that we're thinking about, particularly for the community engagement elective for the 2026 cycle, um, and actually uh, something for across the electives. One is the 2026 cycle, we're looking to do a specific section on civic and democratic engagement, something that collects uh, in one space, uh, the information about voter participation rate and engagement uh, in different campaigns um, that increase uh, civic engagement. And so that will be a different, a separate section. Right now it's kind of woven throughout on the application that will be a separate section in the upcoming um, application. And then um, we're also uh, exploring um, the integration of the UN Sustainable Development Goals across the elective applications. So um, we're not sure exactly how we're going to do it yet, so we're open for, for ideas, but we definitely want to make sure that we are um, doing some integration with um, the Sustainable Development Goals and using that as a way to track um, our participation uh, nationally in, in meeting those, those, um, those goals. Um, so yeah, I think we'll... Um, Open it up. And I guess if Fatma, how do you want to do this if people raise their hand or? Yeah. Um, thank you, Marisol. So yeah, if anyone has any verbal questions, please feel free to use the hand raise feature in Zoom. Um, it's under the reactions. So you click on reactions followed by raise hand. Um, we we'll use that. Um, to just organize any verbal questions. Um, and if you don't have any questions that you want to say verbally, um, just feel free to also select, um, to put it into the chat. Um, but yeah, if you have any verbal questions, please feel free to also turn on your video and use the hand raise feature, please. Thank you. Or if you want to tell us that we did a great job this year, we'll take those too. <laughs> I would say I think you've done a great job this year. <laughs> I'm excited about the new initiatives. I think many of us, as we've seen some shifts in national organizations, particularly those of us who've been in the field for a while. Um, uh, yes, and the Give Pulse group, they, we, it was before we bought their platform, but they were very generous. It was a very, very good experience just having a, a free space to really think about the SDGs, which I think are only going to become more relevant to a way of thinking about community issues. So I've been really, I, I kept coming to the calls because I think apart from the support around Carnegie um and really the collaboratory issues too have been those workshops have been incredibly well designed and supported but i'm excited about the new ideas and figuring out how you know all of our institutions are different in terms of 
how we can connect and you know what works for for all of us but i appreciate the sort of the it sort of visions and experimentation and Stop there. thinking in a different way than perhaps some of our other organizations who have important roles and focus but uh i think for me it's it's um it's opening up different conversations yeah, thank you. And, you know, really our hope and why we were so excited with um, the opportunity to utilize AC Engage is that, you know, I know when I did the application last time, like we received our letter, we celebrated, but then it was like, it was just there. There was no real connection until the next time uh, we went through the application process. And so our hope is that we can continue to stay connected through this platform, share learnings with, with one another, um, and also how folks are utilizing um, the elective classification to move work forward. And so we'll continue to stay connected even in between application cycles um, and um, support the great work that's, that's happening, learn from it, and continue to evolve in a way um, that promotes the core values of, of this uh, elective class. Classification. Thank you. Thanks. Others? What are some key reasons applications are denied? That's a great question. John? Um, yeah, th there's not a single answer to that or even sort of a list of bullets. Um, there's lots of different ways to think about it. Um, part of it is if you can sort of get your head around that this classification is really around institutionalization, that it's deep into the culture of the institution. And then if you think back on the work that was done in the late 1990s around how change happens in higher ed, and it was around these dimensions of deep and pervasive um, leading to transformational change. So I would say the ones that aren't successful are where it's not deep and it's not pervasive across the institution, right? Um, and that's really what the classification is looking for. Um, and the idea then is that with deep community engagement, which is pervasive across the institution, that it will actually transform the institution. None of the campuses are there, but the ones that are classified are working towards that. And right? they're trying to get to that point where the community engagement work is really changing the way the institution operates. Um, so the campuses that aren't successful just don't have the pieces in place to do that. Um, and that can range from a whole bunch of different things, from the kind of infrastructure that they have in place, which supports the kind of capacity building that needs to happen in order to have it be pervasive across the institution, um, to things like it's not in the strategic plan of the institution, so there really is no impetus to operationalize it. Um, and therefore, it, it may be an aspiration of the institution, but they just haven't put enough things in place. And you know, we could go on and on about this because all the applications are different. They're all contextual, both to the institutional context and the communities that they're a part of. So it's really different for all different institutions. I don't know if you want to add anything, Marisol or Lauren. Yeah, and I think just you know what we've seen, sort of the difference between being community based versus community engaged, and really thinking about you know where the engagement piece happens, what partnerships look like, um, how those are framed and, and structured um, are key. Um, you know, one of the things that we're working towards with this new review process is to, this is aspirational, so uh, don't hold us to it yet, but really our goal is to provide individualized feedback from the application process to each campus, both those that achieved it as well as those that did not, um, so that there can be this space of continued learning and maybe uh, you know, communities of practice that come out of out of those. Um, but we're hoping to implement that process through this new peer review process. We'll we'll be able to gather more feedback from uh, reviewers that can be um, uh, you know directed towards um, the institutions in really practical uh, ways. Others.
Um, let's see if I answered all the questions. Uh, do you have, do you have to be successful with your application to experience additional resources? No, you can hop on AC Engage and get access to all the resources. Uh, we're also willing to have conversations with um, campuses uh, who are, are seeking to, to apply. Um, and, you know, right now we are also doing a number of, we will be doing a number of trainings um, in the spring and the upcoming fall uh, that are open and free for campuses to participate in. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so the question about uh, the HBCUs that receive their classification, you can find that information on a list of all the classified campuses on our website. And so um, we can throw that in the in the chat, but you can see all those um, all the uh, classified campuses listed. Other questions? Hey, Fatma, can you take uh, can you not spotlight me and maybe we can do a show see everybody? Great, thanks. I just see my big face all <laughs> across the screen, so I'd rather see everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lauren. So Marisol, I also think that's a good reminder to go to the website. There's lots of resources there. Um, so uh, spend some time looking through what's available. Um, and I think it'll help to answer a lot of questions that come up. And then if there's other things, you know, feel free to reach out to us. So there was a question from Jennifer about, has uh, have there been conversations about building an elective classification for access, inclusion, equity, and higher ed? Um, actually, I think, that those are some of the things that we're starting to think about as we explore the feasibility study for veteran students and justice impacted students, if that could be potentially something that's part of a broader inclusion uh, elective. And so, um, because, you know, things like community engagement, leadership for public purpose, sustainability, there are ways to think about how those are already structured to be institution wide. Right, and that may not be the case with uh, things like veteran students or just impacted students. So it's more, maybe more programmatic or within a specific college, but how is it connected to kind of broader institutional policies? And so it could be, you know, under something that, and this is just sort of thinking out loud, but it could be something that's broader about inclusion that allows kind of specifics around different inclusion themes to be in included in what a broader elective um, could be. And so those are all things that we're exploring. And again, you know, as we um, sort of take our literature review and things we're learning from interviewing experts, we'll bring those back to the field for additional uh, feedback. Um, because we do want to make this an iterative process as we, um, particularly in the, in the pilot stage and as we continue to, to move on. Other questions? Yep. There's also a question. Um, if an institution that was classified in 2015 for community engagement and does not reclassify in 2024, do they reapply as a first time applicant in 2026? And the answer is no. Um, 2015 class classified institutions are able to reclassify in 2024 or in 2026. If you do not reclassify in 2026, then you would reapply for the first time in a, in a subsequent cycle. So um, the 2015 institutions that did not put in an application this round you can still apply in 2026 as reclassification with no problem. Right, and our cycles will be every two years moving forward. You know, and I think um, I'll, maybe I'll give John and Lauren also an opportunity to, to see your reflections on on this past year and the, the work that, that we've done. John, you wanna start off? Yeah, I think for me, it's highlighted by two things. One is reaching capacity. Um, the shift over to ACE has um, allowed for the whole elective process to have much greater capacity. Um, and so just being able to do things that we couldn't do before. 
Um, and then part of that has been the ability to do um, significant outreach, which you saw from the slides, like um, that was pretty amazing. Uh, all of the work that Lauren and uh, Marisol have been doing this past year and uh, the number of institutions and people that they've reached. Um, and I, you know, that's just gonna continue. So those are like the, the big things that stick out for me. Nice Lauren, how about you? much of the same. Um, it's been really exciting to see also for me the elective classifications and the basic classification come under one place. So we can really start thinking about how they speak to each other um, and also think about them as being unified instead of kind of weird cousins as they have been in the past um, because they really do speak to each other and um, some of the themes that we talk about, public purpose missions and how that plays out in terms of um, student success, faculty development, et cetera. Um, so that's been really nice to see where that's where that's heading. Um, I've also I've also personally learned a lot this past year by being in the field with you all um, and all of your questions and learning from you. And that's been really um, rewarding for me too, not just to um, think about the future of the electives, but my own personal growth that's a little selfish maybe, but um, I've really enjoyed that this year. It's selfful, not selfish. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I would, I would say the same. And I think having been in the field and um, sort of working at this level and and experienced it as a, a practitioner, and then uh, at Campus Compact supporting campuses, being able to sort of get in the insides, um, and is has been really important. And seeing the spaces that there is the opportunity to really open up this elective classification for the broader field. Uh, to participate in in ways now that we do have capacity to support it. Speaking of capacity, um, we're hoping to post a position at the end of uh, this month to as a director for the community engagement elective as Lauren and I move towards um, supporting the overall electives process. So just be on the lookout if you if you are someone fabulous who wants to join our team or know somebody fabulous who wants to join our team, but we're excited about the opportunity to bring in additional capacity to support um, the community engagement elective as we move forward. Um, there was a question that came up, do we expect a certain success rate for reapplications versus first time applicants? Um, I don't know if we, we hope for an increased success rate because of the work and outreach that we're, we're doing, um, as well as an increased uh, participation rate from um, uh, you know, the targeted uh, campuses. And what we're really excited about is that, at least in this um, cycle, we have a, a good number of new applicants, so first time applicants to, to this process. And so thinking about um, how our outreach efforts can continue to support the campuses. And then thinking about other ways to um, support capacity building, especially for those institutions who don't have as many resources for this process. Um, and I think what's been helpful for us is talking to those institutions like community colleges or MSIs who maybe don't have all the resources to support this, but they have folks on their campus who um, have been doing this work and, and have been successful in the application process, like what are their hacks and how can you do it on, on your campus um, and continue to support that and thinking about ways that um, either through training and development or uh, capacity building grants or other things, we can um, support those campuses in, in, in achieving um, the, the elective. So, um, you know, that balanced rigor is important um, as well, but it is not about uh, how many campuses don't achieve it, it's really about how many campuses we support in moving this work forward authentically. Thank you. That's uh, really helpful. And, and I have to say, I have really noticed the outreach, um, you know, just the ACE engaged being really helpful, et cetera. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Others? All right. Well, we will stay on for a few minutes if people have additional questions, but we can give you some of your time back. Um, we will post the recording of this uh, year in review on our uh, website, as well as uh, share um, the slides. Um, for us, this is important to share with the field. It is also a way that we put into place holding ourselves accountable to, to the field and being able to hear feedback. And so if there's things that came up or additional questions that, that you have, or just um, 
nuggets of knowledge you want to share with us, please feel free to uh, email us. I will put my email in the chat. Uh, you can email me uh, directly, and uh, we hope to see you at future uh, electives, uh, events, and activities. Thank you all so much for attending. Appreciate you.